refer to the great cricketer here and I'll say, this will do a little bit early. <laughs> oh, there's just plenty going on in the world of cricket around the globe. The world of cricket around the globe. Pakistan, Australia, India, Sri Lanka, the Women's World Cup, West Indies and England. Joe Root doing the absolute business. Aaron Finch is on the show, as is Beth Mooney, as is Tom Deeson over there in Pakistan. Hashtag RCGC. It's all coming up in the next couple of hours. This episode is presented by Custom Swimwear by Budgie Smuggler, all made in Australia. That's budgiesmuggler.com. Don't know you. As is your want, as is your need. My name is Ian Higgins. Sam Perry is up there at the top end. Pez, uh, everything is going on, mate. Everything's going on. Um, we're covering the worst test series of all time. Those are my words. <laughs> but, you know, we're having a good time. We're having a good time watching it and breathing it all in. I'm seeing Kawaja runs. I'm seeing some lion wickets. I'm seeing Cam Green's height. I'm seeing new baggy greens being handed out. I'm seeing leg spin again. So that's something. Are you feeling things? I'm feeling things, mate. Yeah, I don't think there's been any question that about the trappings of this series, about the eye trappings. And I think we need to be grateful for that. But I do echo your, like, confusion, I think. I mean... Did we just watch a classic of the genre, a classic test, one of those tests where, like with Sydney in the ashes, we go, oh, five days, you don't right. get a result. It's the best game oh, in the world. Mate, men round the bat. Oh, Isn't mm-mm. it great? Australia, Australia's fourth innings um, impotence, <laughs> you know, it contributes to the greatest game of all. Uh, or right. have we watched a 10-day test series where 9.5 of those days are blokes having a stick? <laughs> uh, I, of course, there's more going on. Mm. Babar's rear guard, Rizvan, it's really good gear. The passion of the Pakistani fans, incredible. Australia playing in a good spirit. I thought swept and bowled without luck. Uh, it would, I like Australia playing different styles of cricket. I mean, fuck, we haven't seen them play overseas for a couple of years. Like, it's mm. it's a lot of a lot of home track gear we've been ru- uh, rubbing out. Hmm. Uh, and mm. Uh, hmm. mentioned that to the council this week. Uh, so, BetterHelp.com. <laughs> Are we still running that ad? Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, Pakistan, Pakistan are edge lords. They edged us. They edged us yesterday, and nothing really came of it. Uh, you've not asked me. I'm going to say it, and we're catching up with Tom Decent later. Uh, that Australia played some good cricket. Pakistan played some good cricket. Australia dropped catches. I think that's the, that was the closeness of the match. They dropped catches at key times. Smith, uh, Kawaja, late, uh, Head and Manas in close. You can't expect both of them to be taken, but maybe one one might stick. Uh, you know, I'm not concerned about follow-on gear. I watched the butterfly effect with Ashton Kutcher in 2004, uh, sci-fi thriller. Mm. I understand how it works. Mm. Just because that happened, one thing happened the first time didn't mean it was going to continue on like that. I think Australia might have bowled eight or nine sessions in a row if they followed on. I'm cool with it. Uh, I think well done, Pakistan. Australia got some fourth innings impotence. Play on. It's a gnarly European tie. Nil-nil. Let's go. And they're playing the third game of the San Siro, which will be exciting because <laughs> uh, of the short square boundaries. Um, <laughs> you remember Adelaide used to have like short square boundaries, and I like that. Long, straight, short square. But now it's just a conventional oval, and I don't I, I, it, I, did it I, change? I don't like that anymore. I didn't know Adelaide no, it's, it's definitely not as – it's definitely not as – it's definitely wider. It's, Is it? It's thicker now. Huh. Yeah, Adelaide's thicker now. Oh, okay. Um, and, if it, anyway, and if it isn't uh, – it might have just through its stadium redevelopment created the the optical inch, so to speak. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and we all know. Let's look into that. Manscaped. That's right. And Manscaped. Come on. Um, okay, well, you can get all of our daily wraps on uh, YouTube. And if you just want the audio for that, you get it exclusively at Patreon at patreon.com forward slash great cricketer. There's also 81 episodes of hashtag Ask TGC Fridays. And episode 82 comes out tomorrow where we're answering your questions and getting into all sorts of weird gear. So if you want that and the reviews of uh, the daily reviews of Pakistan Australia, still one test to go, of course, um, patreon.com forward slash great cricketer. Um, many good things happen for Australia in this uh, game. Obviously, we saw Swepson. We'll speak about him in a moment. But like Kwaja. Opened up with 160. He's got 97 in the first um, in the first test. He's obviously got back to back in Sydney. People will remember these things about Usman Khawaja. Um, I think he's. 
I think he might be Australia's best batter at the moment. And I put that in the context of Marnus being the number one test batter. And the charge against Marnus is that he hasn't done it away yet, though he sort of kicks out his career after, you know, Steve Smith concussion, Lords, Ashes, 2019 gear. So, you know, we want our, we want our number one best number one player in the world to be do it all conditions. That is what the best player in the world needs to do. And he hasn't quite done it yet, and he's run himself out today. But anyway, this isn't really about um, Marnus per se. I'm more saying, like, Kawaja, I think, is Australia's best batter at the moment. Um, and uh, he is... He's doing so well in Pakistan. He obviously came in red hot at the end of the Ashes. Kawaja will now open the batting for the rest of this year. I can't, unless he somehow drops off an absolute clip, there's no one actually to follow. I mean, Harris is there. Uh, but am I, am I wrong to think that Kawaja is Australia's most stable, best batter at the moment? No, not at all, mate. I mean, obviously, we're not allowed to live in the present. We have to live in the past. I mean, the, the, the question is you know, how much do we rue the lost years of Usman Khawaja? He was struggling when he got mm. dropped in the Ashes. I remember that. It was a close yeah. call for him getting dropped. I don't think, you know, th- there's a huge conspiracy there, possibly around opportunities to return. But that's 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 <laughs> the thing that that's the thing that sucks. They've been short a batter or two for a little while, Australia, and uh, he was there. Yeah. He was there. And and look Yeah. But he's here now, and it's great to see him performing. And Australia just feels a little bit uh, – it feels a little less like one or two guys have to get all the runs. Yeah. Still kind of feel like yeah. once Smith gets out, it's a little bit how you're going. But then again, I mean, Alex Carey made 90-odd in this test as well. Like there's, there's, some good, yeah. Yeah. there's some good shit that's happened. I feel like – the, I feel like the boys are in a pretty good spot, to be honest. I think good toss to win – in Karachi, yeah. to be fair, but like they 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 feel like a, to me that a, a more rounded group. They feel like they have a few more options. I know Swepson went none for 150. I'm biased towards watching leg spin, no doubt, but I thought that added uh, a, a different element than what we normally see in the fourth innings from Australia. I, I, of course, it didn't quite work out. They couldn't get the job done, but I think in the past they've kind of. They've had too many quicks who are putting the ball in the same spot and looking a little bit benign. I feel like they're on the right track. They didn't lose their rag yesterday or the day before. Mm. Uh, they, they may still emerge with a one nil. You know, like mm. I, 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 I think I think things are pretty good for Australia. Um, I'm looking at uh, that that second innings, which just sort of shapes will almost shape the entire series because who knows what the fuck this third test pitch is going to be like. I, I mean, I'm. I'm extremely, I'm extremely disappointed in the in in what I'm watching in this series because we're we're all supposed to be so excited, right? We're all supposed to be so excited about Australia playing away again, us being in Pakistan again, the excitement of Pakistan at home again, and like Pakistan have had this isn't the first Test series they've had in Pakistan. They they beat South Africa, they played the West Indies, they played Bangladesh, and the wickets haven't been this bad. I, I mean, I, I I'm looking at these these ten days of cricket. Pakistan, I don't think have been. In f- like look like winning the game at any point in the last ten days. I mean they, they've they've been rolled for 148 somehow in the second dig here. Bowled, bowled out in 53 overs, which is like, I mean Stark takes three for 29 as well. Is so that sort of gets lost a little bit? Swepson takes two, and then Lyon takes actually Lyon takes four for, and he he could have easily had five because he had, well they had they had Baba sort of um, given not out, and then it was reviewed. And it was umpire's call hitting a lot of leg stump, you know, you know that 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 happens, whatever. But my point being that Stark's taken three for twenty nine, and he's he's always he, Stark's always the one who's like, oh, uh, if you if you're gonna drop someone, drop him. <laughs> and Lyon's got a charge against him as well. Can he do it in the in the fifth in the fourth innings and the fifth innings as well on the circuit afterwards? <laughs> um, but but you know, there's there's guys who are doing good things, and Australia in two tests away from home haven't looked like haven't looked anywhere near like losing a game i mean mm. they, they i don't think they were i don't think they were necessarily the better team in the first test i think it was just a that was that was a complete fucking waste of time in my opinion that first test um <laughs> the second te- the second test they if they take a catch or two maybe a decision goes their way they probably win the game easily um probably so i i, I think i think my point is that they're playing pretty good they're, they're playing pretty good cricket Yep, I I don't think there's any there's any major concerns there. I think they're in 
decent shape. You obviously need a little bit of luck and a good window or two that you've got to exploit to get yourself a win in Pakistan. Uh, I thought Pakistan did shade them in the first test. They took all 10 wickets uh, and and batted a, with a little bit more assuredness. I think Australia won the toss in the second uh, test, which is, mm. well, they did, uh, and got the better of the conditions. We still don't know how that 143 innings happened. Was it a bad batch of balls, a good batch of balls, or what happened with Pakistan? Is it the most Pakistan thing ever? Uh, awesome mm. to see, you know, Baba stepped up, that was that was really good yeah. gear. He's 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 not the tallest dwarf anymore. It's the shortest giant, uh, you know, heading into the big boy club. Uh, next batch, next batch, and Rizvan, uh, you know, <laughs> Rizvan hundred fourth innings. This guy, this guy plays all three yeah. formats. Really good gloves. Uh, you know, he's charging Nathan Lyon to bring up his hundred with two overs to go in the game. Uh, just I love all of that. Kids. You know, kids ecstatic in the crowd. It was, you know, there was a lot of good stuff. Mm. If, Australia, if Australia gets that, if Australia gets that job done in the fourth innings, is it a good test? You know, we can be a mm. bit like uh, retrospective. Maybe that, maybe the deck is okay. I, I, I suspect, you know, playing cricket in Pakistan's different. You know, it is, it is more attritional. You got to yeah. set the game up a little bit more, a little bit differently. But I, I agree. Uh, it's, you know, it's really funny that TikTok's sponsoring it because the nature of the product is almost <laughs> polar opposite. <laughs> To TikTok, yeah, you really, yeah. and TikTok's bad really yeah. got to stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, Baba one ninety six, Rizwan one hundred four. I want to talk about Rizwan because you know, Pez, you know my feelings on wicket keepers with black gloves. I've said mm-hmm. this before in relation to um, Ben Folk, so I want to speak about later when we talk about West Indies England because, yeah. as I've said this before, black gloves matter. <laughs> um, but somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but I, Did you but say that to Michael about, Holding? <laughs> <laughs> didn't come up. Didn't come up organically. But there's something about Rizwan with he's pairing it with um like double lip yeah. white zinc. Double zinc white lip. Mm-hmm. I haven't figured that out just yet. Mm-hmm. But it, it looks fucking sensational. Oh, and so I'm a bit and I'm correct, a bit torn with it. Correct vector. Uh, how could you be torn? Oh, I mean, it's just beautiful. The, the correct vector really of the good. beard. It's a it's a thick beard. It's well well mm. manicured, and he manages to mm-hmm. uh, he manages to frame his white zinced lips. Just so Italian chefs kissing fingers, whole like, thing. Like he he's getting he's getting a napkin before he goes out. <laughs> he's doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's perfect symmetrically. Yeah. Um, Anyway, that's been my that's been my main takeaway. And also, Pez, you, you tweeted this last night. I saw this kid as well in the crowd, um, who was just fucking on the that I mean, that that's that is good gear. That is mm. what it should be. Cricket cricket back in Pakistan. There's a young kid who's just gone absolutely mental for Rizwan, I think, getting his hundred or Baba getting one ninety six one of those two. And he's just fucking hanging on every mm. every ball, every dot standing ball, up. getting getting the draw there. Yeah. Yeah, standing up and uh and then Kawaja drops a catch and then they, yeah. the crowd starts chanting. His name. So and that, then meanwhile he's fucking good. Meanwhile, Austra- good the Australian kid. coaching uh staff was uh com- well, some of them were completing uh barbell <laughs> bicep curls with the um piece <laughs> right near the head of uh, I believe George Bay who was completing his dumbbell presses with wonderful form, chest and pipes, chest and pipes. So everyone was doing their oh. job, I, I felt. They're the, they're the positives. Yeah. Make sure we uh, we lined up Tom Decent uh, to... We lined who, him up. ...who's over, uh, in, in, which is a figure of speech for coming onto the show, just to be clear, right. given other references. Mm-hmm. But we he's, he's over there. He, he's over there. He's over there in Pakistan. Uh, we thought we'd catch up with him to get a view from... From the arena and also some other shit that he's up to over there. Okay, we're lucky to catch up with Tom Decent from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. He's a sports reporter there. He does rugby, he does cricket, uh, and he's over in what? He'd be in Karachi just before he goes to Lahore. Tom, g'day. G'day, boys. How are we? Yeah, good. Uh, first time on the show for you and long overdue, really. Uh, it's good to have another seasoned grade cricketer on. I can see it in your eyes. I can yeah. see it in your salad. I can see it in the way you're holding yourself. You know, game recognised game. Uh, what is your grade cricket background, firstly, before we get into the actual international cricket? Oh, I played a few seasons of ones out at Hawks. Was a keeper out there. <laughs> ones, okay. Yeah, yeah, a bit of ones. You know, happy yeah. to happy to slide that in. Any other grade or? 
Well, then went to Sydney Uni, wasn't playing one, so clearly uh, a, a superior club than the Hawks. Uh, <laughs> got stiff back to twos and threes. Uh, I had a great time. Fines meetings, learned the, the art of tubbing quite early on. Oh, uh, one, a, one a prim with, with the Uni boys. Um, have fond memories playing he goes when he got a pair and dropped a catch and um, then was, was good enough to sign his book afterwards one of our teammates so um, <laughs> they're just the things you remember they are just the things that you remember can we talk about your can we talk about your triple c after the premiership uh third grade flag oh well i have to I have to thank first slip for for dropping one on 13 and then you know Continue to pongo his mate onto the hill at Sydney Uni One, all Arvo. Good day. Uh, 100. Bowled him out for 150, chasing 280. Circuit. Uh, and then, look, look, I have to be careful what I say, but uh, there, there may or may not have been uh, a few season there. <laughs> some, some poor bloke in fucking Bengaluru is listening to this going, what am I listening? What the fuck is this? Some bloke's talking about pogoing a guy onto the hill at Sydney Uni. He's at what? Sydney Morning Herald? Uh, you're, 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 uh, thanks for that. There's more where that came from. Uh, but you, you're in Karachi. It's the, it's the morning after the day before um, or five days before or 10 days of blokes having sticks over there. Uh, how, how do you see it from your end, Tom? Because over here, there's just the classic kind of consternation that Australia didn't get done in the fourth innings. I mean, is it just a... Is it a is it a road? How are you seeing it? Well, Rao Pindi was so flat. I got to the ground three days before and started laughing out loud. And I just said, like, that is the fucking flattest pitch I've ever seen. Um, and eight days later, it was equally as flat. So that was mm. diabolical. Obviously, there was um, some ramifications to come of that. Uh, and everyone here was a bit nervous as to what this pitch was like. And I don't think it broke up as much. Like, granted, Australia didn't get those wickets yesterday and they should have Nathan Lyons lucky that he got three late because then he sort of well you know the what does that mean for him but uh I think the Australians would privately be thinking wow that pitch didn't break up as much as it should but like fair play to Barbara Azam and Mohammed Rizwan that was just ridiculous hitting it was kind of one of those tests where you think it was probably being there like made it better like uh, I think if I was wanting to watch that aside from day five back at home like that would be a tough viewing and Australian viewers just aren't used to pitches like that and scores like that. Like it was a bizarre test in its own, but Hey, like the theater, at least at the ground. And um, it was fantastic. The Boobazellas Zellers that were driving us all crazy as you could imagine. I don't know if you guys can hear it on the coverage, but it is, uh, it is insane. Mm. Um, on the other side of the fence, uh, Tommy, like a Pakistan, a Pakistan, like happy with, with this. I mean, it, it, I sort of get the sense that, it's obviously a huge series, you know, they've played test series before Australia's come out, but Australia is one of the, you know, the big nations to actually play. And, and so it's, it's a big deal, but there's, are they, are they talking as well about like, no, these, these wickets are good and happy with everything. And are, are you getting a sense of that? Or are they a little bit like, Oh, this isn't great as well. Well, I think it was telling that Rummy's Raja, the chairman from the PCB basically said they made a flooding in Rao Pindi to nullify Australia's quicks. And the Aussies were like, well, is that the right way to go about it? Like, was we just played on something for the fun of it? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know what they expect over here. I think they thought Karachi was going to be a, more of a spinning deck. Lahore apparently is absolutely dry as anything and should turn more, but you just don't know at this point. Um, oh, look, I think they were... I Look, them getting rolled in that middle session on day three, I think was just bizarre. They... they Reverse swing obviously was a massive factor. It didn't it didn't reverse as much in the last session, and that was some seriously good batting. So they deserved to come away with a draw. But you just hope that at nil all, um, like at least both teams will chase that win. Like if Pakistan play for another draw and it's nil all, then it will go down as one of the most diabolical series of all time. If we're sitting here with no 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 results after three tests, right? I think that's what's strange about this game, mate, and why people are like like we don't really have the literacy or interest in how games are played in other countries to like talk about it that well in Australia. But for most people, like if you, almost most games, like when you roll a team in the first innings for 140, like it's very rare that soon afterwards they actually bat better and like way better. It was like, it was two different games. Like how did, I mean, and I think that actually backs up why Cummins batted again. Like how, how do you think Cummins knew that, the second innings 
later in the game when the pitch should have been more difficult to bat on, how did he know it would be harder to bowl on than the first one? Like it was at the ball they picked hmm. was, was it an aberration in Pakistan just bat badly or is it that pitches, the pitch actually can't, like was alive and then died? Oh, well, yeah, you're right. I mean, they clearly extracted more reverse swing when they were ripping through Pakistan, but even the even the idea that you would bat beyond a second day and into day three um, was just absolutely well, Australians just can't grasp that concept, right? You know, mm. bat for bat for five sessions, send them in and try and get two before stumps. Cummins was like, "No, that's how we're going to play about. That's, that's how we're going to go about it." But if you talk to anyone here, they they just say, uh, "Like they've been, they think his tactics have been outstanding," and, and and that's just how you play it here. And they try and give themselves as much time. Don't try and bat last on that pitch. But I can't answer that question either. Like, I just think that was almost, I, I sort of don't subscribe to the fact that it was, it got super, super, super flat. Like, um, Australia dropped their chances. Like, if those guys in close take one, if Steve Smith doesn't drop one earlier in the test, it could be mm. a different story as well. Like, poor Mitch Swepson, he, he deserved better than that. I thought he bowled pretty well, to be honest. But um, at the same time, there was a few funky things. Manus Labber, Shane Wise Hanley coming on for an over with three to go. All that stuff. I don't think they rotated their bowlers as best as they could have. Um, but I, I don't have the answers. And quite frankly, I reckon I've said pitch every fourth word in my copy. So it's um, it, it's wearing a thin <laughs> bit. <laughs> More of it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so was it flat there or um, no? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, like what Pez and I were just talking and we just sort of came to the conclusion, um, therefore it's now gospel. But I think Australia is Australia's playing pretty well. Like the the team is is running along fine. Um, like Usman's come to the top, secures some more runs. I think Swepson's played this game. I thought he bowled really well um, in both innings. Actually, um, more variety there. And Stark, three for Lions got a few. Like everyone's doing okay. But is that what, what's your observation of how Australia's performing? Yeah, well, I mean, we've got to keep in mind they haven't played a test for what nearly three years abroad, which everyone knows. Mm. If foreign conditions and they're going into a third test, zip, zip, come and said last night, if, if you'd asked me that two tests ago, would I have taken that? I probably would have. Do we believe him? Yeah, like probably when you think about it, but Lahore is going to be a hard place to win. But you look at, you know, Usman and, and Dave Warner scoring runs at the top of the order as an Ashes next year. Like that, that's a question. Like, can they stick around for that? Maybe, mm. I don't know. Um, Marnus is Marnus. Steve Smith is actually getting back in the runs, albeit not 100. Travis Head, well, he's plundered them in the summer. That's fine. Cam Green's mm. tall and he's fine. He'll be looked after. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Green's tall and he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and he took a great catch in the slips. So that gives yeah, him cred. Big time. Yeah. Uh, big mitts, all the usual stuff. Um, so he's fine. And then uh, a few of the quicks. A um, few spinners, but I'd love to see them get funky in Lahore with their team. Um, I'm happy to share it with you. There's been a bit of chat. Like um, they're gonna have to, you know, mix it up a bit. Those quicks bowled a fair few overs, and I think mm. it would be harsh on a guy like Swepson and Albeit he's bowled so many overs as well. I don't know whether he's going to be cooked after that, but I'd, I'd like to see him play again. Mm -hmm. Any other chat? I mean, is it? Are we looking at three spinners? Would does Agar come in? Bosses are batting a bit, or does Scott bowl and get a run? It's it's a quick enough. It's a quick-ish turnaround. Yeah, four days. There's a sense that Cummins isn't a massive fan of three spinners, but right. he, he may be inclined to do that. Mitch Stark looked the most devastating when he got the ball reversing. So, so it's almost like the reason they played him over Hazelwood for, was for that reason, and it was justified mm. when he took those poles. So then do you bring mm. a guy out? Because obviously Cummins is going to play. Scott Boland's sitting around waiting to, waiting to bowl. Um, Ken Bowl. You know, Ken Bendy's back on flat decks. We know maybe he's he an option. Does Agar come in? Does the big Bison Mitch Marsh get a game and you just mm. take head out and try and play? You know, you get Green and Marsh as your quick cover as a, as a funky option and try and squeeze Agar in as well. I don't know. I'm not a selective, but I'll be trying to find out. I'll tell you that. I mean, um, just aside from Nuffy on field chat in grade cricket terms, uh, how is it being over there from a, you know, from a journalist perspective, you know, if you had any, you're doing any good gear behind the scenes as in, as a figure of speech, <laughs> um, there's been none of that in Pakistan, Jesus I presume. Uh, <laughs> I no, I mean, how's, how's the circuit? You got anything on the, anything on the boil, anything special behind the scenes? Oh, look, I, I arrived and we all arrived a bit, bit anxious about it. As you would imagine the team, 
gets uh, helicopters and the whole street shut down. So everyone keeps asking them how they're going, but spare a thought for the journos who just jump in our car and old mate drives us to the ground every morning when it's, you know, complete fucking chaos and we're nearly yeah. getting T-boned and like it's, it's, a, it's a jungle out there. So we're, it's a mission to get to the ground every day. Um, what else? Yeah, like uh, I teed up an interview with Shoab Akhtar, which was, which was great. His manager said, uh, do you want to come over to Shoab's house and do it? Oh. Um, the story will be running this weekend. So we thought, yeah, sure, why not? Um, look at it. Didn't, did, yeah, have a look. Uh, didn't know what to expect. Walked into his mansion, uh, takes us down to his bunker, and the room is just full of show picks. Like I'm talking oh, yeah. dozens and dozens of show picks. There's a big six foot one on his wall which says, Show, we miss you. Oh. Um, <laughs> Like the, the photos yes. are unbelievable. I, I highly encourage you to have a look. And then mm. uh, we do the interview and sit down. But the best part of the interview is that Charles' manager is a lovely guy. This is a bit of a stitch mm. up, but he, he asked whether he could have a photo of him behind the camera, you know, of like one of his signature pics behind the camera while we were shooting, which was great. Had a fantastic interview. Um, asked if we wanted to have some tea. And then he was like, Oh, do you want to go out for a bit of dinner? And we were like, Oh, well, you know, first te- first day of the test is tomorrow. Where could you land? Am I allowed to? Okay, right not. Why not? Takes off in his Mercedes, the Royal Pinty Express, just ripping down the highway. No seat belts, all the usual gear. Starts calling up his mates. Want to go out? You want to go out? Want a circuit? Want a party? Didn't say circuit. Want a party? Want a party? We're all there going, oh my God. First test is tomorrow. You don't want to go too hard too early. Go out for dinner. But it was like royalty, right? Like he's he's Pakistan's version of Sachin. Walk down the street with behind him, and you are watching people's drawers. Jaws literally dropped at this bloke's walking around on the streets. Pretty cool experience. And then, um, yeah, I've never seen a hungrier bloke for a circuit in my life. That night, um, we, were, we were having <laughs> dinner. <laughs> he's, he wanted to go out. I, I don't know whether he just loves Australians. He obviously loves loves them. He spent a bit of time there. Yeah. Um, but he wanted to go out big time. We had to talk him off a cliff. And I'm, I'm a bit disappointed that we didn't because it was the first test the next day. And um, so it turns out that the guy we were talking about over at dinner, Shane Warne, um, passed mm. away the next night. So Shit. fairly busy day. Mm. Um, and he was a bit rattled by it, as you would imagine, after it. But um, no, a fantastic fella. And he couldn't have been more hospitable for the, the few of us who were there. And um, But an experience you won't forget. And uh, yeah, just being in his... It wasn't a dungeon, but it was definitely a, 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 a it wasn't his main room, but uh, the, the amount of show merch on the on the walls was unbelievable and just what you would expect. And uh, yeah. Perfect. Oh, oh, that is that is unbelievable. Oh fuck, I'm into that. Um yeah. I was gonna ask you, Tom Barr, before you go. I'm not sure if you've caught um, you know, I, AFL seasons back. Uh so uh cricket now um uh descends uh into the into days the ether. Good. Yeah, days are going good. Uh but uh you know, colleague uh Tom Morris uh cops an absolute hammering from a coach uh, in the press conference uh last night. I recall that happening to a young journalist uh from the former Australian coach. <laughs> um and he, I just want to know if you got any advice to Tom. Oh, look, I haven't met Tom, but he held his ground really well. That was a disgrace from beverage, wasn't it? That was like, we were getting on the bus back and saw all that. Um, how do you handle it? Well, Jail was, Janet, I think Jail and I had a pretty uh, forthright exchange back and forward. Careless whispers was what he said to one of my questions. He later apologised afterwards, but um, uh, he's gone now, so don't have to worry about him. <laughs> oh, I don't know, man. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Hey, uh, Tom, thanks so much for joining us, mate. I know you got to get on a flight to Lahore now, and that piece on Shab is out. What Saturday? Is that right? Uh, probably Friday lunchtime. Friday Saturday. lunchtime. Oh, SMH in the age. We'll 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 send a tweet about that as well. Uh, uh, you in Shab Akhtar's dungeon. I'll be reading that. Oh yes. Awesome. Thanks, boys. Appreciate it. Thank you very much to our close personal friend, Tom Deason. Uh, India, Sri Lanka, Pez. Uh, you will recall that India won the first test by an innings and 222 runs. That was now referred to as Jadeja's test, of which so I think he has many, to be fair. But, you know, he had a pretty good game that last game. This game, uh, India won the toss. They got 252. Shreya Sire, who ended up being man of the match uh, and the only guy to pass 50 in the game. He hit 92 in the first dig. He got 67 in the second dig as well. Um, and then Sri Lanka had a go. This is also a pink ball test match, by the way. I should have said that. Um, 
And this pitch was an absolute ragger. Uh, it was good fun. That, uh, that, uh, that I like a fast game. I like a TikTok game myself, uh, ironically, because TikTok is banned in India, as I said before. Uh-huh. Um, Sri Lanka bowled out for 109, <laughs> and Bumrah took Pfeiffer on a ragger. So there's that. Uh, India then went out and got 303 for nine declared. Shreya Sire 67. They set Sri Lanka 446 cricket runs to win. And Sri Lanka uh, battled valiantly to get 208. Uh, so they lost the game by 200 and uh, whatever. Um Ashwin, four for in that, in that fourth innings. Boomer got another three, eight for the match on a ragger. Uh, Shreya Sai was mad the match, as I said before. Two nil, series win. Pretty comprehensive in all fronts. Um, but uh, but uh, you were saying before, <laughs> that's the end of the test season, I suppose. That's the end of the test yeah. season for India. And yeah. they've just uh, fucking smashed Sri Lanka. That's what you should do. That's right. And 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 this segment's brought to you by Crick Info, just reading scores. Uh, I can just imagine people sit, <laughs> people sitting there just go, okay, yeah, what happened next? Okay, yeah, I got 200 odd. Okay, or, <laughs> oh, yeah, or Aya, 92, okay. Uh, Karuna Ratna from Sri Lanka made a good 100, but all in vain. Uh, it's taken India three days to win in Mahali in the first test, taken them three days to win in Bengaluru. Uh, the main thing from an Indian team perspective, I thought, was was the first test series with Pajara and Rahane out and Vahari and mm. Shreyas Iyer in. Uh, they're playing some tier two, tier three, tier three shit with, actually with no respect to Sri Lanka there. And it was, Zero it, was respect. A, it was a success, I think, uh, bringing those guys in. Uh, the other the other thing that was notable is Punt moved up to number five. He made 185 runs across three innings with a strike rate of 120. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, he he yeah. he kept excellently conceded five buys and that's you know keeping the three spinners on raggers uh, and yeah. the second test was under lights uh, so that's that's mm. Jadeja Ashwin and Axar Patel Axar Patel is the third spinner for India he's their number three <laughs> uh, and I just think that we don't know when Australia is going there it seems to be that yeah. they're imminently yeah. going to say that it's going to be in Feb next year rather than September yeah, it's this a bit year. Of chat. Bit of chat, mm. uh, and I just think that like under lights facing those three, spe- like is there going to be a test under lights? That'll be hilarious, and I don't think there'd be a bigger test for a batter. Like Manus is going to have to get his razor mat uh, with like literally razors on them, oh, and, yeah. and then try and get some Bunnings yeah. floodlights or some shit uh, just to <laughs> semi get ready for that. I don't know if Cameron Green is tall enough to get his big front dog down the wicket uh, <laughs> far enough. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, I reckon there might be a little bit of trouble Yeah uh, With the old uh, pink SG Or whatever the fuck they're using over there um, uh, I noticed uh, in the mate, rankings What do they mean? Do they know things? Let's find out yeah. uh, Boomer moved from number 6 in the w- No, he was 10th in the world I think To number 4 I don't know if that means anything I mean no. like I'll just look at like there's a, there's There's such a good I mean, anytime we play test cricket pairs, and you recall this when you did play your games, yeah, that every bowling attack just has worldies. Like, like Rabada is just so good. Um, and then obviously Australia. I mean, every time Cummins comes on the bowl, I'm like, he's just the best. But then I watch like Boomer bowling, he's like, oh, that's, that's pretty good too. Yeah. Um, and then I look at England and I thought, hmm. That's how he won the Ashes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think Karun Ratner got, got his, he's in the top 10 now as well after his, his hundreds, the highest he's ever been. Um, I'm not sure, really sure what it means uh, other than like rankings. I think my point is rankings don't mean anything. If Boomer is like, uh, you're the fourth best bowler in the world. Ah, I feel like it's a bit harsh. <laughs> Something to talk about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But he's, 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 he's higher than um, four. Um, so now I didn't realize this. I mean, I recalled this when we were covering it last year, but you just said it off air, Pez, that India's next test match is at Old Trafford, where they are actually going to complete that test. Do you, you, you must know more things about this than I. I didn't realize that was they were going to play it. Yeah, I, I, I think it's at Old Trafford. I know that's what the one they cancelled. I'm not exactly sure yeah. where it is, but they're going to play it. Yeah, the, that's on. So that series, that's that series between awesome. India and England last year is still alive. Yeah. Uh, England can still mm. salvage that. Edged. Oh, absolutely. And I do not think that's going to be a ruined orgasm. So, uh, yeah. It, <laughs> it, it's India heading yeah. over for one test. That's that's some big time stuff. So, uh, yeah. yeah that, that, so, yeah, I get the impression that's the end of the international season. Uh, they come back for that test match. 
there's a couple of a couple of white ball games, uh, but nothing mm-hmm. of real consequence, I think. And yeah, yeah, we we head into the IPL, which brings us to uh, an announcement of our coverage, which is going to be enormous. Uh, we're, we're we're going big on the IPL. If you want to join, it's primarily on YouTube. Uh, we'll put some stuff out on Patreon as well, but we're doing all the reviews we're doing last year. Uh, Shane Watson is now the assistant coach at Delhi. And so people have said, oh, that's a shame. Watto's rap's not going to be on anymore. Incorrect. Watto's rap is on. Okay. You know, we had, look, our lawyers spoke to Delhi's lawyers, spoke to Watto's lawyers. Uh, that didn't happen in case anything comes on the track. Uh, but what are, what is joining? What are, what is joining the show again weekly? Uh, we're going to be doing some comedian stuff, way more player interviews than last year. Fingers crossed, and uh, and some live stream gear. It's going to be big, pretty much every day. IPL, 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 or you can get TV rights deal next year. Hmm? That is all to come. The Women's World Cup, though, is a thing that's happening right now, and I feel fucking good about this, Pez, because Australia has smashed everyone. <laughs> They're four out of four. Um, everyone else is losing, except for South Africa, who've won all three of their games. Um, Australia's net run rate's 1.7. It's three times better than everyone else's. Um, okay, let's go through the last two games. Yeah, you, you, Pez, you know that I'm a big net run rate guy. Uh, mm-hmm. They don't really know how they figure it out, um, nor do I do really care. Um the last two games that Australia played since we last convened on this show, uh, New- <clears throat> they played against the host New Zealand. New Zealand won the toss. They sent us in. Australia got 269. Elise Perry, who's got man of the match, uh, plus, sorry, man of the match, play- player of the match <laughs> in the last two games, got 68. Then New Zealand rolled out for 128 and 30 overs. See you later. Darcy Brown blowing him away, three for 22. Then they played against the West Indies. West Indies all out for 131 and 45 overs. At least Perry, player of the match, three for 22. Ash Gardner coming back after getting COVID, three for 25. Australia chased that down, 30 overs, three down. Rachel Haynes got 83, not out of the 132. Australia play against India on Saturday. India have already lost two games. Uh, so obviously they wouldn't want to lose a third game. But uh, obviously, Australia and India have got a good history recently uh, between those two teams. England have lost; they've only won one of their four games so far. England, they're defending champions, and England, England, they got a good team. Their only win was against India, uh, which was yesterday. So uh, there's that. So basically, it's sure shape up nicely for Australia to um, just cruise into the final, uh, pick up some silverware, make me feel good, and makes me feel good. Pez, that Elise Perry is getting Player of the Match awards again. It's a name that I recognise. I like seeing the action. I like seeing the batting shapes. I like seeing the Adidas stick. I like all of that. Uh, and Australia just winning stuff. Uh, you know, makes me feel comfortable. Safety. Uh, anyway, you spoke to. Uh, I was not part of this, but you spoke to Beth Mooney uh, earlier on. Do you want to set this up, or do you want to just throw to Beth Mooney? I don't know what else to add. I spoke to Beth Mooney. <laughs> okay, the person I'm about to speak to has scored 3,361 runs for her country in 114 international matches across all three formats, 400s and 2150s. She's been the number one ranked batter in T20I cricket across the world for three years running. Uh, she's the number four ranked batter in ODI cricket. I think it's number four because she barely gets a go because uh, of people who are above her. Uh, she won the Belinda Clark Award in 2021 for the most outstanding female cricketer in Australia and in four World Cup games as we go to where in New Zealand she's only been dismissed once. Uh, also says she's a dog whisperer on Instagram, which uh, is very welcome on this show. It's a pleasure to welcome to the show Beth Mooney. G'day, Beth. G'day. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Look, before we get to the World Cup, onto the more important matters of grade cricket, Beth, uh, you're from Harvey Bay, Queensland. You played your grade, you play your grade cricket at Sandgate Redcliffe, I believe, yeah. uh, unless you changed clubs recently and, you know, <laughs> or, or, or people are trying to get you across. Uh, I, I saw, I just saw one piece about you in relation to grade cricket from a couple of years ago. You made 100 in the 2020 final, um, that is in the year 2020 just a week after making 78 not out at the MCG in the T20 World Cup final uh, in front of 80,000 people um, and being named player of the tournament. People might remember that. Uh, I just want to know, just with that experience of that 100 in the grade cricket final, did you hear groans from the opposition uh, as you walked out to bat? Um, And how do you compare the pressure of an MCG final in front of 80,000 people and billions on TV with the real pressure of needing to score runs in a grade cricket final? It, well, actually, it's tough. It's a tough world 
playing grade cricket, to be honest, because you do walk out there and people expect you to just miraculously be on 100 before you've even faced a ball. So um, there is that element of pressure, I guess, from that side of it. But at the same time, I think I was getting a lot more daggers than anything walking out there that day because I'd barely played a single game all year and just showed up for the final as as we love to do as grade cricketers. So <laughs> um, I'm a bit of a FIFO player for Sangay and I've come flying in and out and make the occasional appearance. It, you know, was it a big circuit after you won the, uh, you know, the first grade final or was it a, was it a bigger party after the T20 final? I look, I probably, to be honest, had been on the circuit all week between the, <laughs> between the finals. So I probably uh, was due for a rest after the, the grade <laughs> one to um, sort of top it all off. But um, yeah, definitely there was a, a few beverages happening in that, um, especially that week after the T20 World Cup final. Ah. Uh. And, and with Sandgate, I can, you don't have to answer this. I can just only imagine the, your own teammates as you turned up going, oh, great. <laughs> this should be good. Anyway, you don't have to respond to that. Uh, look, uh, Beth, the, the women's ashes obviously happened. Um, once you got going in the series, I saw you, you missed out in the first innings of the test. You, you made, then you made 63. You made 73 in the ODI. You missed a couple of games. And then in the World Cup, You've gone 27 not out, 23 not out, 30 and 28 not out. And I, like many other people, still want to ask, how is your jaw? Uh, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's been put back together with some titanium plates, which is, which is always nice. Um, it still gets a little bit sore. And um, I don't know if anyone saw the Meg Lunning hug the other day, but she pretty much, her shoulder went straight into the side of my face, oh. which wasn't comfortable either. So um, I had a few words words with Meg after the game. Um, well, as many as I could, given she's the captain, I don't want to get dropped. So um, it's all right. It's still a bit tender and gets a bit sore, but um, generally speaking, it um, hasn't stopped me from playing too much career, which is good. It is good. I mean, like, I feel like the literacy around people getting hit around that area is better than it used to be. And it strikes a lot of people that like uh, it, it can have an impact on one mentally as well. Have you experienced that? I mean, I'm reading through your scores. It doesn't look like it's impeded your ability to score runs. Uh, how, how, how's the, how's your, your, I guess your psychology after that kind of um, episode? Um, initially it was, it was okay. Cause I'd sort of just got straight back on the horse and, um, started playing and um, it, it happened in the nets I think which was helpful because when I walk out to bat in the middle it's it's been totally fine I had a little near miss um, when I was training in the nets during the ashes when um, young Darcy Brown is coming in to bowl at me um, and you know I think a few of them have been told pitched up to moons and and whatnot and she accidentally slipped one out and nearly the same thing happened I just managed to get a, a glove glove in the way in time um, <laughs> but that was a bit stressful and then um, you know we had our analyst over here bowling and you know he gets a little bit too competitive and um, you know he let one slip and said it was an accident and it was the wicket but um, I think he got um, a bit of a spray from some of this coaching stuff. <laughs> I don't know who your analyst is, but your analyst. So what you're saying is at one point your analyst has just decided to come in off the long run and start Pretty bumping much. you m- mere days <laughs> after you broke your jaw. That's good. That's, that's a, yeah. that's a good ego uh, from that guy. Hello to that guy. Uh, okay. Just with the world cup moons, um, you're four from four as we go to air, we, we expect that at home now and it makes us feel safe and thank you uh, for that. But um, England was close and then you basically thrashed Pakistan, New Zealand and the West Indies. Uh, how's the team feeling about its cricket? Yeah, um, all things are sort of going to plan at the moment, which um, is unusual for us in a World Cup. Usually there's a, a little bit happening um, in the way of um, adversity and things like that, but I think... Everyone's feeling really good. We've we've got a day off here in Auckland tomorrow. Um, I think a few people are playing golf. Um, a few of us might go over to Waiheke Island and, and check out the sites over there um, before a big game against India um, and then South Africa. So um, there's a couple of tough games coming up for us that we really want to nail. And, you know, with such a long tournament as well, you got to make sure you're peaking at the right time. Obviously, there's no point getting getting it all right now because um you know there's there's a lot of big games coming up um and you you want your best players in the 
or you want all your players in the best form possible. So, um, yeah, we've sort of at a point where we're just training the day before a game and, and making sure we're still getting away from creating and around that. I love tournament talk, isn't it? Like you're four from four and now you have to kind of explain that, oh, the games don't matter. You've got to peak at the right time, etc. I'm sure you still want to destroy India on Sunday. Anyway, <laughs> um, okay, can I talk, can I ask you something more broadly about the, the team's motivation? Uh, like we, we, we do expect you to win all the time now, you know, even if people might be semi aware of the World Cup, you know, we will be bang into it come finals time because we want to bask in your reflected glory which you give us all the time <laughs> um how, like how does the team deal with its status as a as like a dominant number one side that's expected to win because we've seen different individuals and teams make sense of that in a variety of ways across different sports you know uh, like maurice green the sprinter disgraced i think uh he said if you want to be number one you got to train like your number two michael jordan said you know you you know, he needed to find enemies to make things personal. Like, how, how do you guys stay hungry? Do you, do you find enemies? <laughs> we probably do have a lot around the world, actually, given um, how successful we've been. And, and hopefully that continues for obvious reasons. But I, I think actually what drives this group is there's so many good players um, back home in Australia that could easily play international cricket for any team. And, and obviously the people that have missed out on the game so far and, in this World Cup are, are quality players. So what, you've always got something sort of someone biting at your heels, trying to trying to be in the 11. And um, it's an absolute privilege to to play for Australia. So um, everyone makes everyone better in this team. And obviously our goal is to, to make sure we're consistent and um, staying right ahead of the pack that's sort of chasing us a little bit at the moment. Uh, how much does not winning the last ODI World Cup figure in the team's conversations? I know it's something that people will mention in the media because it's more like, oh, here's something that, you know, the mm -hmm. team didn't do perfectly uh, once four, five years ago. Uh, does, <laughs> is, is, you know, so that's a problem. Uh, yeah. does, it, does it motivate you guys or is it literally five years ago and it's a new thing? Oh, it's, we don't talk about it. We, mm. obviously it was a long time ago. And this group's so different. There's a lot of new faces, not only within the, the playing group, but also within the staff as well. So we've got different lenses and different perspectives for people um, that have cut, that have come into this World Cup that, you know, not that the those of us that did play in the previous one still have scars, but um, they obviously have fresh eyes and fresh perspective in, in a tournament like this. So um, it doesn't come up at all. I think it's the media that hounds us about it a bit more than, than anyone within the group. Yeah, I mean, like from our point of view, it's just like trying to find something too controversial to say because the team's basically winning all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a clicks thing. Uh, okay, you, you mentioned one of the motivators being, uh, you know, staying on your toes, keeping your spot uh, because there's a lot of good players. We saw a couple of games ago, Jess Jonathan was left out for Alana King and Amanda Jade Wellington. Meg was really clear that uh, you just wanted to go aggressive, so you went with two leggies, taking wickets, et cetera. I mean, Jess is the number one ODI bowler in the world, number one ranked ODI bowler in the world. Um, she's back the next game, takes two for 18. So that's a great comeback. Uh, is, is it a function of wanting to keep people on their toes? Is it, is it experimenting with the lineup because you're in a tournament? Is it a matchups thing? Um, or do, do the wickets vary that much that two leggies is to go somewhere else? Are you trying to find a settled lineup? I realize you're not the captain or the coach, but <laughs> any insight into that? Oh, obviously this is just all theory based from my point of view because yeah. I'm not involved in those conversations. But um, I do know that the New Zealand batting lineup specifically have a bit of a weakness against leg spin um, and the ball turning away from their bat. Jess is obviously a quality bowler in her own right, but probably slides the ball in to the right hand is a little bit more than she turns it away from them. So um, I'm guessing that was the theory behind it, just genuine matchups and um wicket taking ability as well in terms of you know Darcy Brown came into the 11 again and um we wanted to be really aggressive up front and take wickets like that um and obviously um Wello bowled exceptionally well that game too so um we didn't see that same team against the West Indies because um I didn't look at the matchups or anything but I'm assuming they probably weren't as weak against leg spin as perhaps the New Zealand batters were uh, just finally, Moon, before I let you go, uh, just a word on India coming up as we go to air. They're 
playing against England. Uh, you got them on Sunday. Uh, they're, they're the ones people are tipping to really take you on. I mean, not just in this World Cup, but but generally. Uh, you know, when you're four from four in a tournament in a good spot, are you just going to say, look, it's all about, you know, it's just more about us and we're experimenting. It doesn't matter. Or do you, you know, read the news that they've just recently got a sports psychologist, uh, you know, who's trying to help some of their weaknesses. And do you want to find out those weaknesses and exploit them and perhaps make enemies of them? <laughs> I think any opportunity we get to play against a quality opposition is an opportunity to learn what their strengths and weaknesses are. So um, I think it's going to be a huge game in the context of the whole World Cup. Um, depending on obviously what happens in this game against England that they're currently playing, I think um, there's a lot on the line for both teams. If I think if we win win this game on Saturday, we'll pretty much lock ourselves into a top four spot come, coming into the finals. So um, that'll be nice to tick off um, if that does go that way. And obviously India will be in a position where they'll want to I want to sort of lock themselves into a top four spot as well. So, um, yeah, it, it'll be a really big game. I think they'll, they've shown their class in the last few years and um, they find a way to win when you when you think they're not going to. So um, hopefully that doesn't happen against us. <laughs> uh, Beth Mooney, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you guys are obviously just at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll find out how it goes. Uh, my tip is that, uh, you're the big game player and uh, expecting big things. I don't know how you meant to respond to that, but um, I'm just saying <laughs> that. Uh, anyway, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you very much to Pezzy Lad and to Beth Mooney. All right, West Indies and England. Um, apologies to England fans for the timing of these podcasts because the first test has sort of been and gone and the second test has uh, the, the first day of the second test has just started. But I want to talk about what's happening um, with England specifically. Um, so in that in that test, the first test was a draw. Um, West Indies got a bit of a lead in the first innings and then England came back in the third innings. Zach Crawley got 100. Joe Root got 100. And then they put the West Indies in and they finished at 147 for four. Uh, so the game was called. But it wasn't called quick enough uh, for Carlos Brathwaite. Uh, who uh, he's, he's obviously not playing in this test match, but he's a current West Indian all-rounder. Uh, and he said, in relation to uh, the game going on for too long, in his opinion, in my opinion, it did go on than it needed to. If I were the West Indies captain, Craig Braithwaite, or any of the other senior players in that dressing room, I would have found it a bit disrespectful that in the last hour, with two set batsmen batting the way that they were on the, and the pitch offering nothing, England felt as though they could get six wickets in the last 10 overs going up until five balls left. If you want to become a top team, you have to think like a top team. And the West Indies may not be there yet, but the mentality has to be, would England not have done that if it was an Ashes test or against India, New Zealand or Pakistan? I think the answer is no. So why have they done it against us? The West Indies are a better team than we give them credit for. This passage of play proves it. And now we have two test matches to prove that we are better than England think we are uh, and then Brathwaite added uh, he added those views on social and he just said uh, he just did a tweet said a bit disrespectful this uh, so Pez when's the right time to call off a game <laughs> I, I, I have to answer that question like with a broader lens he goes uh, like please I think a lot of people will be able to relate to this like I think there's something wrong if by the end of the any cricket match at any level, backyard, village, grade, yep. subbies, stick cricket, fucking wheelie bin shit. Um, yep. If there yeah, isn't a scenario shit. where, it, like you, you, like you need a scenario where everyone concludes that any behaviour from anyone else <laughs> by the end of a match is disrespectful, apart from your own teammates, right. like. Tell me, like you know, name me a time where you didn't play a game where, by the end of the end of the game, you and everyone else was of the view that there were shit umpires, shit tactics from the opposition, shit handshakes, shit song, shit bunch of blokes, <laughs> shit tees, fucking shit roads getting out here. Like it's completely irrational, but I actually think it's very healthy. So I support yep. Carlos Brathwaite's comments, <laughs> and I think that West Indies cricket's in really rude health when things like that are being said. I think it's good for the game. I yep. think it's very natural. I think doctors would yep. approve of it. I think you would read about it in books as being a very critical part of the um, development of the brain. 
Absolutely, Pez. We've nailed that. I mean, so so um, Braithwaite was on BT Sport, so he's he's obviously broadcasting predominantly to England with that, uh, with that with those views, and I like it because if you like when when you fin- when a game is called at you know at the end of the day is playing any cricket, as you just said, if like if ninety five percent of the people aren't pissed off, yeah. who've either participated in the game, officiated mm. the game, driven their kids to the game, and then left them for a bit. If you've if you're a dog and you're trying to get onto the field yeah. to do your lap on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon, that's right. One thing about the dogs <laughs> trying to get a run in. The fuck are these cunts doing? Yeah. Hey, it is. It's a deeply existential <laughs> thing, and and the anger. Yeah. It's obviously irrational. I mean, England's just England's playing to win. It, it's actually just respectful to play to win. Yeah, but yeah, but like the the, the anger comes from somewhere deeper. You know, like it, it comes yeah. from, it's it really why comes from a why do I do this? It's the why do I do this uh, strand of cricketing philosophy, uh, and I think if you're asking that question, I think a lot of psychologists would say you're on the right track. You've you know, yeah, uh, a friend friend of the show, Paul, uh, who who used to be on the No Question About That United podcast. He's um, oh, yeah, he's a psychotherapist, and you know, I've heard I've seen him post things from his place. Saying you know you've you've got to for growth, and I believe this too. I think this is good gear. You've got to name your demons. You know you've got to name them. What are the things getting in the way of your growth? And I think Carlos Brathwaite is getting there by kind of questioning why do we do this? Why are we here? Yeah. I think he's on the right mm. track, and I think that's why we see that so often. I don't mean to actually trivialise Paul's work there. I really respect it, but uh, <laughs> I do. Yeah. I do. Hello, like Paul. But yeah, uh, th- that's. Uh, I think this is really normal stuff. I don't think I, I think anyone getting up on the high horse saying, oh, you know, it's actually respectful. Nah. And, 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 and if you rise to it, then that's good media gear. I mean, everything about it is right. His producers would be happy. Yeah. Uh, yep. You know, there's clicks. We're talking about it. He's a pundit. Mm. You know, maybe mate, cricket exactly. would have its Roy Keane stuff. Mate, mate. I mean, the highlight, of, the highlight of the Ashes for England was when Moe and Ali made it very awkward for Alistair Cook on the couch. That, that was that was the highlight that's where he was right. just fucking calling him out for being a shit captain. A bit harsh, but. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm watching it. I'm clicking right. it up. Exactly. Giving that a like and giving that a scared like. No retweet, but yeah, scared. Yeah, yeah. Um, From the back. The only person that should be happy when they leave the ground on a Saturday afternoon is the person who's got 25 in a losing side to think, you know what, I've done enough yep. to keep that fucking 16 year old in fourth grade out of mm. this team this week yeah. because I'm doing my job for exactly. my team. We've lost, by eight, we've lost by eight wickets today, but I got 25 and the selectors were there for about 15 minutes. They saw me play. I'm, I'm, I'm back in this team next week and I'm the alpha dog. Yep. And I don't That's know how... That's the only person who's happy. I don't know how I did it either and I won't have that conversation with myself. Like, I, I'm genuinely no. bewildered <laughs> that I I managed probably through force of, yep. like, uh, just general mm. probability where I averaged 13 during the whole season. Yep. But that, that necessitates that on some occasions those mistakes are avoided for just a little bit longer. And I made 25 today and those those... Those numbers, the mm-hmm. two and the five next to your name, which you went and looked at straight after you got out under the guise oh, of asking yeah. the team score, that yeah. that What's sustains score? you for a whole week mm. uh, minimum oh, yeah. until the next fuck up or humiliation. And you, what you're trying to do is you won't go to practice that week. I mean, you might you actually might go to Tuesday practice to be you, just to ask people how they got on, hoping that they ask you the same question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but what you're gonna, but what, but what you do is because we're all um, so deeply spiritual in the game that we mm. we're not going to try and like work on our cover drives more or the short ball or, or anything pitching on the stumps. We'll think now what what was it that I did this week? And it was actually that um, that strawberry milk that I had on the way to the game. So I'm going to yeah, do that every week milk. now until it doesn't work. Yeah, strawberry milk. Uh, out of a carton, a carton uh, of strawberry milk, which you which you leave in the car, and there is some pretty. <laughs> s- it just gets a little bit kind of sticky and syrupy when you get back in to the car, and you clean that out once every four weeks, and you're 21, and also your mum bought you your car, but she shouldn't have done that for your own development. <laughs> You know, you He's also like, went. Well. You also went to training on Tuesday because because your twenty five gave you license to say to the boys yeah. as you were hunched yeah. over, no, with no eye contact, yeah. got to get to training on Tuesday, boys. Because the other teams won. They're singing the song, <laughs> and it's the first thing you say. <laughs> oh, it's nice to go for a lap, isn't it? It's nice to get back into that. Maybe we should do more of uh, that. Oh, is that Crawley better? Yeah, well, yeah. Jason, he not he gives a fuck. Fucking strawberry <laughs> milk. That's me. Cricket is strawberry milk stuff. <laughs> mate, all, mate, all of that was just a, a, a reminder to fucking never play this shit sport again. Uh, Join us on Patreon. IPL deal. 
Yeah, that's what we right. talk about on Patreon. That's right. I oh, fucking hate cricket. Um, <laughs> hey, mate, just just other stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. other stuff on the Great Cricketer Podcast. Um, mate, there's there's just so much like mismanagement going on. It seems fr- externally. Um, there's obviously no Broad and Anderson. We know that. Um, Mark Wood didn't bowl in the fourth innings oh, yeah. of um, the first test because he's he's got elbow pain. Ben Stokes is supposed to be being managed. Uh, for a comeback, he bowled more overs in the second innings than he ever has done. I think he bowled like 28 overs or some shit like that. Um, Wokes um, averages 55 playing um, with the ball, playing in, in a way test. They're actually using a Jukes ball in this series, which is weird. Um, but um, 55 away from home, it's all a bit what's the point. Um, but I will say this, uh, Ben Folks and the team keeping up to the stumps to um, Wokes is sex. That is okay. sex. He, I think, I think Wokes is the best. I know he's like, he's folks. not necessarily, a, you know, first name of the team sheet. So, folks, yeah, folks is the best keeper in world cricket. I think, mm. as in gloves. gloves, pure gloves, gloves, pure gloves, um, pure gloves. Um, yes, which is the name of my um, magazine that I'm releasing. It's a, it's just a glove catalog, pure gloves. Oh, you're getting into magazines, um, though. That's a good. That's a good business. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing print media stuff now. Yeah. Glossy stuff. Media. Glossy yeah. magazine, sort of oh, higher, higher end. Oh, it's glossy. Yeah, glossy, pure, yeah. pure gloves. You, yeah, those pages are stuck together when I'm watching folks. My yeah, God. and what is it? Is um, it is it men in wicket keeping gear? Um, it's uh, it's Ta- a lot taste- of it's actually just like watch. Com- it's a, a lot of it's just like watch commercials where like you like you just see blokes just like holding their hands like in really uncomfortable positions. Yeah. Um, and you're just like showing off a bit of wrist. Yeah, uh, that kind of, it's mostly that. So it's like driving gloves. Yeah. Um, leather gloves, fingerless gloves. Yes. Um, golf gloves. Um, and yeah. just pictures of Ben folks sort of around the house, um, that kind of gear. Yeah. So like um, t- tasteful soft core pornography for those who are yeah. um, whose proclivity is gloves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting into that business. <laughs> yeah, because I, I saw I saw this great niche with feet, and I was like, well, you know what's better than feet? Yeah, hands. So, pure gloves. Sim- sim- and you are the choreographer and designer. <laughs> symmetry of color. And um, yeah. adjustment and placement of kit across multi sports. That's right. That's <laughs> and right. Ben folks that's is what, the, what, Ben folks is the cover boy. <laughs> <laughs> I hope people are enjoying our coverage of West Cities in England. Um, so the second test is obviously going to get outdated, but um, the second test just started today. They've just finished for the day, and Root has hit another 100, 119 red ink at the moment. Um, Zach Crawley got 100 in the last test. He got a duck uh, in this game, swings it around about, say. Dan Lawrence batting at four, three. He got out for 91 uh, on the second last ball of the day, so uh, uh, close but not close enough for DL there. Um, I don't know what else to add with Joe Root. I mean, it's funny when he had that great year, and then, like, he didn't break the record of most ever, but most of for England, but um, but uh, I still think like oh that's over now just because it's the calendar year, and so now he's a different player. But he's just cont- he is just in unbelievable nick. I mean, th- he's getting into he's getting into better form than Steve Smith was for that that period of time. Th- this is it's unbelievable the amount of hundreds he's getting. Not in Australia though. Uh, yeah, he's he's batting three, uh, and that, so that's a change for him. I mean, it's not really yeah. into. Not really in terms of when he's out there, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's he's he's, <laughs> he's a glass act, uh, but not in Australia. So sorry, you know. Um, yeah, expectation. <laughs> I don't you know, rate so. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it still so was a, it was a, and... a little bit in Australia. Just you know, not not. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. exactly the Pretty same sure as what he produces everywhere 50s. else. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, anyway, um, mate, there's there's like I understand the the Zach Crawley thing. I understand because he went through a period where he averaged nine or twelve or some shit for England, right? He had this run of games where he just couldn't get up the square. There still seems to be like a bit of um, I'm just reading online stuff, but but Good. a bit of like, nah, I don't I don't like Zach Crawley. It's like they've got so few guys that can score test hundreds, and this guy is clearly one of them because he fucking got one last game. Mm. I don't I don't understand how. I mean, <clears throat> maybe I'm giving too much credence to online shit because obviously the selectors are going to stick with him now. But I mean, if you've got a guy. In the England setup, who is capable of scoring Test hundreds? Pfft, fucking first name of the team sheep after Joe Root. Um, anyway, I suppose they've, they've now got broader problems. Uh, ironically, um, in terms of what their bowlers are going to do, um, 
But, Good to uh, see. Uh, yeah, no broad. Anderson again is weird. You see Joffre in the Nets though. There was some net stuff of Joffre. I mean, oh, that's probably, I didn't see that. That yeah, Joffre net stuff. He's over there. Joffre net stuff. That's probably my digital business. That's my new one. Just net stuff. Okay. Uh, with Joffre. Yeah. So and, an e, is it an e magazine? Uh, yeah. It, that's a spin off. That's a spin off of it. It's primarily online. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, Anyway, yeah, it was good. It was good. It was good to see that. Ah, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, it was. It, it's a. It's a shame. It's a shame that he's missed out on Australia, and also yeah. how fucking cool would it have been to see him bowling against the West Indies in the Caribbean? You know, that would have been really cool. Anyway, True. I hope he comes back True. in full force, however he wants to. Absolutely, completely agree with that. Um, all right, um, that's what's happening in the world of cricket. Uh, if that's what you come here for, um. Pez, we spoke to Aaron Finch, who gave us uh, 25, 30 minutes of his time. And we had a really good chat, a really honest, good chat. And he was very giving. Um, and, uh, yeah, but before we before we, uh, before we we get to Finchie, uh, Pez, Budgie Smuggler. We've got to thank Budgie Smuggler. We want custom gear again. Hey, we're going around with Budgie Smuggler. No one gives a fuck about any of this, but we're, we're, we're signed on again. It's a great relationship. It's a special relationship. Uh, and that usurps yeah. the US and the UK. Uh, especially this will be like six years now five years six years no, I mean, he's a lot Linny and Budgie guys are the lifeblood of TJC if you like TJC you yeah. like Budgie uh, we encourage yeah. you to check them out uh, now a couple of things I want to note firstly we're fucking dressed by Budgie most weeks and if you're looking on camera that's what I'm talking about baby Budgie smuggler right oh, yeah. there. Now, yeah, it's oh, probably yeah, better. Look, l- to be fair, Linny did request that uh, Higos be modelling that from a chest perspective. I'll make it my way. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but uh, I've got a few things in order now, so I just sort of mentally and around my family stuff, I've just I've got oh, rhythm. So yeah, I like no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna track, I'm gonna track that with some dress by Budgie gear. Also, I just, well, this is a normal thing that I do, but Budgie Smuggler also arranged some North Sydney Bears Smugglers, which is custom design. I'm holding that up there. Hang on. Oh, so away, yeah. away from hell the Hell yeah. But look how beautiful that is. That's 1991 version of the Bears. Oh, uh, there yeah. There was three, there was yeah, three yeah. they put out there. I bought all three. Uh, and a little bit of budgie on the back. I like that get, red. Can, you, yeah, I mean, that shade of red doesn't get much better. It doesn't get much better than that, really. Uh, and that's a that's a quality of custom design you're going to get. Uh, I want to. Um, Raise something here goes in relation to England and West Indies in the Caribbean. This was passed on to me by a dear friend of the show, Ali Martin. I like to think that Ali sort of, we, <laughs> Ali's been a journalist for many, many years and he's very storied and I believe just won a Sports Journalist of the Year award in England. So congratulations to Ali, but obviously did a few flying hours with TJC earlier before getting onto Sky Sports. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, sent through by okay, him. Okay, my leg up. Probably doesn't have a chance. Game a platform. The Daily Mail, uh, the Daily Mail is um, papping the England England players over in the Caribbean, and uh, okay. there was a there was a Daily Mail article papping like Ollie Pope and Dan Lawrence and a couple of other players in the beach, like at the beach in the Caribbean. I'm just trying to get the focus back on my on my face here on this camera. And I think because people mm-hmm. lose it when you get blurry. Anyway, and uh, mm. and I just want to read a little bit to you. This is the this is the copy of this. Uh, England cricketers Ollie Pope and Dan Lawrence bowl over beachgoers as they strip down to their shorts during Barbados getaway with the squad. Uh, Ooh. Referring to Ollie Pope, the 24-year-old yeah. wore a pair of dark green swim shorts featuring edgy panel prints as he covered his nipples with his hands before splashing about in the sea in Bridgetown. Mm. Dan Lawrence soon mm. joined him while showing off his toned torso in a pair of lilac shorts and his dark brown locks in a side-swept hairdo. <laughs> He accessorized his look with a delicate chain necklace and put on a very animated display as he crashed into the waves. Um, look, look, uh, full respect to Ollie Pope and Dan Lawrence. Ollie Pope, friend of the show, great cricketer uh, in his own right. But shorts at the beach, beater as fuck. All right? Yeah, yeah. Smug. I mean, yeah. and he's got he's got mates, more alpha behavior, more alpha people like Ben Stokes who do rock smugglers more often. Fuck the shorts off, Ollie Pope, covering your nipples. Yeah. The budgie smugglers are about no shame. It's about owning your rig. They celebrate ordinary rigs. If that's you yeah. listening, watching, budgiesmuggler.com for not only custom design budgies, but also if you don't want budgies, accessories, gifts. You got hats, bucket hats, underwear, 
face masks, stubbies, bum bags, rassies, sh- uh, socks, towels, tees. If you need to get a gift for somebody, there's a lot of accessories there. It can be fun. You can design mm. it. Uh, and looking forward to an announcement shortly about a, a very funny collab we'll be doing with Budgie Smuggler that uh, involves the listeners and the viewers uh, and boats. Uh, so, yeah, just I'm um, putting that out there. We've not even talked about it. He goes, so looking forward to bringing oh, that together. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. BudgieSmuggler.com, use the code CHAMP for something. Here it is, Aaron Finch. Okay, it's Australia's white ball captain joining us for a second time in the pantheon of TJC podcasts. Uh, he's the reigning T20 world champion skipper, and he's the man who Fox Sports this week described as being handed a late $269,000 call-up um, by a record ninth IPL team. It's strange to be handed that kind of thing. But anyway, uh, he's also many other excellent things, not least a friend of the show. It's our friend and yours, Aaron Finch. Finchie, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, boys. Uh, now, Finchie, uh, just from the top, uh, I mean, in grade cricket, if a guy changes clubs twice, you can't really trust him. Um, yep. I'm not sure people actually say that, but it's implied. <laughs> um, yeah, certainly is. And I've changed clubs like two or three times. Now. Uh, <laughs> you're at your record ninth IPL franchise. You know, can your yep. KKR teammates trust you? 100%. I think what, what, is, what is important about it to remember is I don't make those decisions. Other people make those decisions in auction and release and stuff. But I try and look at it from a different point of view. If you've been shit for so long and nine teams still want you to play, you must be... You must be a pretty good bloke. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> you must be. You must be a ripping bloke. <laughs> that's, uh, that's that's the only take I can I can have from that. I was oh, I see finish about like the. I mean, having played in so many uh, clubs uh, or franchises or whatever. I mean, how much does like the ownership sort of dictate the energy and the vibe of of and and the success of that team? Because I mean, we've seen heaps of stuff. Obviously, like. There's obviously something going on there at Sunrises with, with Dave Warner and, and we see it with many other franchises, one comes to mind straight away. But there's something about ownership and, and, and IPOs, which you don't really see in other things in cricket because, well, I suppose the public own the Australian team. So, you know, it, does, does an owner dictate the success in lots of ways? Yeah, I think that they, they have a big say in the mood of the group and, and how it's ran. I think some, some owners are really hands-on, um, even without cricket expertise, that they, ser- they turn into experts in the game above mm. the coach, above the, the directors of cricket and above the players. I, I understand that it is their franchise and, and they own it. So so they're entitled to, to have that belief. But yeah, they, the different franchises certainly operate very differently and, and have a different feel about them. Mm. And it, it must have been you know, disappointing to miss out in the mega auction. Um, but, but I always wonder about families in these situations. So you've got a partner, you've got a young daughter. And when you get the call to go over to the IPL, having thought, look, I'm not going to have to go um, from a family perspective to India this time around. Is it, is it tough to readjust that? I know they're heading over with you a little bit later, but um, is, is it bittersweet or is everyone just like result will be able to pay for a new extension? <laughs> well, well, we're actually looking to do an alfresco here at the moment. We did a, we did a full renovation a couple of years ago um, and the one the budget flew out a lot. So, so we've been planning an alfresco for a while, but anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, what is really interesting is that over the last probably seven years, Amy and I have been planning on trying to get to New York for, for a couple of weeks, for literally for seven years. And every time there's been a window of opportunity, something's come up. There, there, was, uh, a, there was an Australian tour that came up at a different time, obviously COVID for a couple of years. And after the auction, we thought, right, this is a great opportunity to go on a, a really good holiday. Esther's really young. Everyone tells us that it's great to travel with with someone when, with, with a baby when they're really young because they can't run amok on a plane and things like that. So um, it wasn't surprising when I got a text from Brendan McCullum last week saying, are you interested? And I think I wrote back in world record time, yeah, absolutely, I'd be interested and, and would love the opportunity. And we were sitting at dinner. And after I had that, after I'd replied on, on the text to Baz, I turned to Amy and said, oh, by the way, would you mind if I went to the IPL? And, and she's obviously very, very supportive. You, you don't have a huge amount of time in this game comparative to, to your life. So um, she's, she's been unbelievably supportive of, of some very selfish decisions over the years to, to put cricket ahead of anything else. And, and can I just ask there as well, Finch, you just, I mean, we, you know, we've all been in relationships, but have, have you just taken the classic ask for forgiveness, not permission approach there as well? So you sort of 
you sort of put yourself forward and accepted it and then mentioned it to your to your partner i mean no, it's a yep. classic of the genre uh, i've been there i've been there today uh just, just to clarify <laughs> what was your issue uh, it was traveling to Sydney for work in a scenario where I um, hadn't worked the schedules out correctly. And now there's going to be, you know, conversations, but the, the job is accepted. So, yeah, I mean, it's similar. Uh, it's not, it's not IPL money, but you know, it's something. Yeah. And no, she's very, very understanding. Uh, it's quite funny. Very early in our relationship, I said, I'll always put cricket first uh, while I'm still playing it. And um, as the relationship developed and we got married, that, took a little bit of a backseat as well because I become number two in the house and then we got two dogs this before we got married. Then we got two dogs. So I become number four in the house and I'm well and truly down to five. So yeah. I spend most days asking for forgiveness to be fair. <laughs> Finchy, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I, I was, I was going to say, Finchy, I, I was actually in, in New York three weeks ago and um, I've got to tell you, if, team came knock, came, if they came knocking, I'd, I'd have a look. Uh, I would have a look if an IPL team <laughs> came after me. Uh, I, I would Mate, think about it. Lit- literally seven years we've been we've been trying to get there, and, and <laughs> we're like, right, this will probably be our last holiday mm-hmm. while I'm still playing because obviously the T20 World Cup later in the year comes up, yeah. and then and then it's a pretty packed summer, and then there'll be a build up to the 50 over World Cup, and and then I'll retire after that from a particularly international cricket if I make it that far. Um, yeah. So we thought this, this would be a great opportunity while Esther's still young, but. Yeah, not to be, yeah. but but very very happy to be joining Kolkata. And and you've also got you've also got preseason for your grade team, um, sort of beach runs, um, yeah. throwdowns, meeting some guys. Um, well, you, you know, I haven't played for Geelong for a little while. Um, <laughs> just the, the time hasn't matched up in the schedule. Yeah. But one thing I did yeah, notice, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and maybe this is why, one thing I did notice <laughs> when we we're down there for the Melbourne Renegades, when when, when there's a beautiful net facility uh, that that has been built in the last probably. 15 years, David Kelly, the former president. So David Kelly, international net or international cricket net facility, whatever it's called. And there used to be, um, there's an Ian Redpath net, obviously he's legend of the game. Uh, Wayne Phillips, there's a, there's a couple of others. And I, I had a net. And there, there's were all in green because I'd played test cricket. Mine was yellow because I'd played ODI and T20 cricket. This is before I debuted back in 2018 and I went down there recently with the Melbourne Renegades. I thought, right, the only net I've been in is my own. And I went down and the, and the sign's not there. So I don't know, I don't know whether it's a sign that I, that I haven't been available to play for Geelong for a while, but they've, they've just taken it off me. I was going <laughs> to, that's interesting. That's an interesting power play. Yeah. Cause I, mm. I just noted last week, a little bit before you, you made 67 for the Vicks in the Marsh Cup, and then you were asked about your red ball status and you confirmed that you wouldn't play red ball again as you wanted to give young guys a go. And I just wondered, you know, surely that doesn't apply to, to Geelong. I mean, um, well, I looked, at, I looked at white ball cricket at the moment. It's all, it's all one day 50 over cricket because of the COVID. They can't question. afford to stretch it out over two weeks. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, like in the, in the Geelong advertiser, I see a headline recently mm-hmm. saying cats open to Aaron Finch comeback. I'm sure they are. Uh, but like <laughs> a look. after um, starting yeah, to have a look at him, <laughs> um, maybe give him his net back. But I'm just sort of thinking after after 15 years of first class cricket, international cricket, all formats, T20 cricket around the globe. I mean, how, how brightly does the fire burn for a couple of weekends in the dirt at Cardinia Park? Well, it, it burns a lot brighter now that they're only 50 over 50 <laughs> over games, but uh, 96 overs in the field just seems like an eternity to me at the moment. And and like I did say um, after the the WA one day gamers. Uh, if, if I'm not going to play test cricket, there, there's absolutely no point in, in taking up a young kid's spot because there's some seriously talented young Victorian players coming through who that would, that would be taking their spot. And, and I'm not suggesting for a second that I would get selected in the first place, but I think that that would be incredibly selfish to, to put myself ahead of, ahead of the young kids and, and their development and Victorian cricket's development, because it's just not, it's just not who I am. And, and, if you get stuck in the dirt for a day and a half or like Pakistan fielding onto the third day, that, that is enough to break your heart. Yeah. I was actually thinking about flat wickets and, and, and you're batting with uh, Ryan Carter's in 2014, maybe you got 503. That wasn't flat. That wasn't flat. <laughs> that was the game was called off because it was a, it was a ridiculously difficult wicket. Mm. Just a bit. Was to, it be fair, to be fair, the, the, ball, the ball bounced about that high. I was out at uh, Blacktown 
and New Zealand were, were playing the first test the following week at the Gabba. And after we <laughs> batted, they, they said, they said, there is no point in us batting on this because we're going to the Gabba to face, I can't remember what the Australian attack would have been, that probably had Mitchell Johnson, Hazelwood, Stark, Cummins, maybe Ryan Harris around that time. And mm. if you're facing them out of Blacktown, they're bouncing around your ankles, you are not getting out of the Gabba in the first <laughs> test. So uh, fully understandable. Get this bloke off uh, the front dog. Yeah. <laughs> I was basically Martin Guptill by leg spin at that one point. So, uh, <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the Brendan McCullum by and seeing that. So it wasn't, uh, yeah, what wasn't, wasn't the finest wicket I've ever, ever batted on. Um, Finch, I mean, let's go to the T20 World Cup. We didn't get a chance to speak to you directly after the tournament. So, you know, huge congrats on the win. Looked like a lot of fun. Uh, some sensational performances from the guys, obviously, but, but as Skipper, uh, and I know you've, you've talked a lot about this, but like, has there ever been a more valuable example of successful coin tossing in the game? Um, you know, was it, was it grounds enough for an improved contract? Um, where, where, where are we landing on the tosses here? Yeah. Oh, it obviously played a little bit of a part. Uh, I think majority of teams won, won batting second throughout the tournament, but that's, that's not uncommon in T20 cricket. It was quite funny in the in the semi-final. There was just something inside me that said that wanted to lose the toss and bat first because I thought against Pakistan, if we can put a big total on the board there, their top order had been so good in, in Babar Azam and, and Mohamed Rizwan. But if we can get through them early, the, the middle order hasn't played a, a, huge, a, a huge role in the tournament because they just haven't had the opportunity. These guys have been batting for 10, 12, 15 overs in games. So... There was something inside of me that wanted to lose a toss and, and bat first. It's, it's a case that I would never have batted first if I won the toss. But yeah. um, throughout the tournament, we we were on the right end of that, no doubt. We I think six out of seven. The only toss that we lost was against England, and they and they did a number on us pretty heavily. So um, I, I think I even won the first two pre- uh, trial games, like warm up games. You know what? <laughs> I don't know if I've ever told anyone this story. In, in the first first warm up game, we played New Zealand, and Kane Williams and I went out to toss, and we just flicked the coin up. He won the toss and said, "Oh, we'll have a bat." And I'm oh, sorry, we'll have a bowl first. And then the match referee came out and said, "Oh, can you do the toss again?" It's um, like it, this is a televised warm up game. So oh, okay, no problem. And I won the toss and said, "Oh, we'll have a bowl first. <laughs> okay, we'll so look at me. He goes, "What are you doing?" He goes, "Oh, I won the first toss." I said, no, you can, you can bowl first if you want. He said, no, too bad. You've done this to us now. Um, yeah, so that, that, that was quite funny. It was, it was a bit of a piss take more than anything. Yeah. Um, there's some, some pretty amazing performances in that World Cup. Finch. It was like the South Africa was the first game, Pakistan and New Zealand. Like, there was a pretty heroic individual performances. But there's, there, seemed to be, um, there seemed to be like that dressing room seemed as united as I had, have seen for a little while. And there's obviously all that stuff going on with the coach for the, the last coach for, you know, a, f- a few years or whatever, but there's something about that dressing room and those performances, which said, which signified that that was a really united dressing room. Where do you think that came from? Oh, I think the boys just really embraced the challenge of playing in the UAE. It was, it was as, as foreign conditions to us. In, into the, and I think that's why mm. nobody gave us much of a chance because we're going to the subcontinent where traditionally we haven't been as successful as in Australia. And, and that's, I think that's just natural. We, you grow up on, on completely opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of wickets. Um, we just embraced it. We had, we had a lot of fun. We, we played a fair amount of golf throughout the, the trip as well, which, which, is, which was great. There, there wasn't a huge amount of time to be spending outside of the hotel, but we embraced the COVID bubbles and, and the life that, that that meant that we had to play under throughout that time. It was every meal as a, as a group or as close to a group as you can. Um, we, we trained really well. We trained hard. We, we, we just, we, we had great fun. We, we stayed in Dubai. We stayed on a little nine hole golf course, which was, which was actually nice. So we were, boys were able to get out to the driving range every day and, and whip around and play a few holes here and there. So it was just one of those tours that, that you remember forever for as much off the field as it was on the field. Mm. Inchi, um, I know you, you made a, a joke at the top of the show about still getting picked in IPL teams, even though you say self-deprecatingly 
you're going shit <laughs> or whatever or whatever it is. And I want I wonder about that. So you are a circuit selection, but but in, in all seriousness, um, <laughs> you know, there's there's been there's been questions about your form at international level for the last little while. You don't need me to read any stats to back that up. Uh, um, no, well, I didn't have any anyway. <laughs> um, I mean, as if I would do that, just straight to your face. Go, well, actually, you average it. Yeah, that's that's an odd thing to do. Um, obviously, a skipper, the, like the ideal result is to go to Pakistan, regain some form. Um, do, do you feel like you need runs to guarantee a spot for the World Cup? Um, or is it better to... Is better to lock it in, um, to lock in the World Cup and just and just spend that time grooving yourself so you're ready to go in October. Well, I think, it, yeah, no, no doubt. I haven't got the amount of runs that I would have liked. I think tinkering with a few things in my technique recently, um, coming back too soon from knee surgery as well probably didn't help. But I pushed that really hard for the World Cup, and that was something that that I was really proud to be able to get through that, um, albeit on one leg most of it, and and not contributing a huge amount in the field. At, Myself and Adam Zample were fighting for the 45th position uh, or short third man. And um, it was it, that, that sort of hampers your technique a little bit and probably makes your movement pattern slightly different. So from that point of view, it was it was difficult. But I think getting back to full fitness, I, I feel really good now. Uh, I've got no doubt that I think my record over the last decade is, is pretty good. So I've still got a lot of confidence that that I'm a, I'm a pretty good player. Fair enough. Uh, I, was, I was just, I mean, just, just sort of going back to, I mean, it was sort of at the end of your career, if it was like Finch, you saying before, maybe, maybe a couple of years left, but you know, the, and the, the sort of test, the, the baggy green thing is a thing that you did and you achieved that. How do you, how do you reflect on your time playing test cricket? Because it was such a tumultuous time in Australian cricket generally with after sandpaper. And then you come in and you got to face India at home. That looked hard. <laughs> and then you got to play Pakistan. Was. In, <laughs> you got to play uh, Pakistan in, um, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, it's quite. It's just. It's a funny time, and then the test is being filmed as well for Amazon. So there's all that. Like, but how do you reflect on playing Test cricket for Australia? Yeah, I, th- I think that my first two tests, which was Dubai and Abu Dhabi, I played pretty well. Um, mm. Similar conditions to what it is in white ball cricket. If you if you're honest, it, the, not a huge amount of bounce, not a huge amount of movement. The reverse swing and spin plays a bigger role in, in those conditions, and I, I felt as though I, I had a good crack at it. Um, Honestly, I just think I was a little bit out of my depth playing against India in a, in Australian conditions. It was, um, I'm, I'm no, well, I, I still should have played better, no doubt. But was there was there better selection choices? Probably was, um, but that's okay. I'm I'm still really proud of of giving it a really good crack. I think um, the the one thing I probably would have done different through that time is I was probably listening to so many different people talking mm. about how an opening batter needs to play in Australia. And it was, instead of just trusting what I did, I, I probably listened to 10 different people and said, oh, this, this is what really works in Australia. And trying to tinker with your technique the day before the Adelaide Test match, you, you're probably not giving yourself the best opportunity. And, and I think over the years, I've managed to play with the flaws in my game and, mm. and protect them reasonably well while still maintaining real good strengths in other parts of my game. And, and I probably just went away from that slightly. So, um, but yeah, I, I've still, that, that would be the only thing I'd do again. It was, it was great fun. I mean, to, to mm. beat India in, uh, in Perth on a, on a really challenging wicket, got, we got sent in, I think we got sent in, uh, paying him on a batter first, actually. And there was some big cracks. There was a lot of movement early on and to get through that and put on, I think the highest partnership of the game with Marcus Harris, we were really proud of that. So yeah, there's still some really, really cool things that happened in those five test matches. Yeah, absolutely. Can I, can I just follow up um, on, on that? that? It's an interesting one that you were saying, maybe there were better selections. Because remember at the time you were batting five for the Vicks and then you got picked for open the batting for Australia. And I wonder in that regard, how much weight was, because at the, I mean, at the, I mean, you've been killing it for in white ball cricket for international, in the international scene for so long. Um, how much value do you put on like, as someone who has proven international quality player, over someone who is maybe a, a red ball specialist with a equal records that you sort of, you know, you were doing so well white ball cricket for Australia. It's like, this guy can do it at this level, but it's almost a different sport. So in some capacities, isn't like Boomer with a red ball is, is different to Boomer with a white ball. Yeah, it is. And I think 
yeah, I think there was probably if if they were picking the the, the side. Obviously, I was I was in there as a as a bit of a stopgap anyway because Davy and um, Bancroft right. out of the top order weren't there, so I, I understood that. I, and I think I think I got sixty. 49 and 30 in my first mm. three innings mm. or so, something like that around that. So it was, it was probably just natural that I, that I continued on. Um, mm. if, if, if I had have got dropped after the first, the first two tests, when, when we come back to Australia, it wouldn't have bothered me one bit, but mm. um, that, that, that's still, yeah, that, that's still a tough call to make. Um, mm. I, was, I was still, I still thought I could do the job, no doubt, hundred percent. I thought that I could still be successful uh, open the batting there, but yeah, it just wasn't to be. I, I didn't didn't play nearly as well as what I could have. Mm. I think you, it's very kind of you to be so open about that as well, man. I'm sure people yeah. um, um, appreciate that. Uh, like you just mentioned before about listening to a lot of voices. Like, I mean, tell me if this is on the mark or not. I mean, firstly, um, the current generation of players must be very thankful for how many um, ex players are out there willing to offer their uh, advice and views. Uh, all the time, but like, um, do, do I do I detect that like the current generation is pretty keen to kind of put their own mark on playing at the moment and doing things in a way that's kind of true to them rather than uh, necessarily being um, a good impression of of legends that have come before. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. I, I think guys are probably have more access to coach higher level coaching from a younger age too. And I think one thing that that might have happened in the last maybe decade is that co- guys get poor advice early as well, and and you see this sometimes with with young players. They come in and, and somebody immediately watches them play once and tells them what they need to do better or what they need to do differently. I don't know anywhere, anywhere in the world or any industry that you can see somebody do something once and then say you you need to do this differently or, or you have to change this if, if you want to be successful that's something that you need to build up a relationship with someone for one because if you coach them wrong first well then you, you're gone you, you, you'll you lose that trust between player and coach you might see someone on a bad day you might see them on a really good day you, you, you need to see somebody dozens and dozens of times to see what is what's a habit what's a pattern what is what is um a bad day or a good day, what, what footwork looks like. I'm just, I'm just talking purely batting at, at this point. Mm-hmm. So, so everybody, well, not everybody, I say that wrong. A lot of people want to be the person who fixes a player or I was the reason that, that he was successful. It just doesn't exist. Good players are good players. Mm. If, if coaches took that away, took that mentality away and, and watched and listened and, and built relationships more often, then I think that that coaching could be could come back around again, and players would be a little bit more receptive. Because the last mm. thing you're going to want to do as a player is just to be continually told, well, "No, you, you've got to do this differently." In the end, you just go, "Well, I can't do everything." It, it, there's only mm. so many thoughts you can have going through your head at once as a as a batter, and, and it should be watching the ball. So if, if you start being told you you need to cover drive at this level, or you you need to move in this certain pattern everyone moves in different patterns and a lot of it will be something. So for me to change my technique at 35, if it's a significant change, that's going to take so long because I'll, mm. I'll have footwork patterns from when I was six years old. But, and and mm. that's how long it takes to, to nail things down and to change that. It will be so great. So coaches being able to step back and watch for a lot longer than, than and, and choose the right time to, to intervene and try and implement something will mean a lot more to the player than, than the coach that just comes in and says, change this, or you're not doing that, or, mm. or you have to do this. So, so it's a really, it's a really interesting point, but um, not, not all coaching suits all players as well, but, but guys definitely have more self-confidence these days. I would, I would say, especially young guys coming into groups that they're, they're generally very confident in their game. And um, yeah, that's, that's a part, that's a part of the younger generation, isn't it? How um I'll let you go. We'll let you go in a second because it's going way longer than I told you it would go for. But um, that's okay. I can talk um, all day about this stuff. Oh well, I mean, <laughs> just just on that because you piqued my interest. Um, I, I I really don't ask this question in relation to the to the JL stuff. It's really much more global than that. Like how mature? Just from what you're talking about there, you, I mean, you sound like you have 
the emotional intelligence to be a good coach. But like, like how, how mature do you think cricket coaching is? You know, that, that scenario you describe at the, like just then, um, I guess I'm curious as to like how many coaches as a percentage you might come across that's more from that first bracket that just want to fix you or say you're doing this wrong and you've got to do it like this if you want to perform at this level and how, what percentage of coaches actually have that, that more multi-dimensional approach who can treat players differently or understand they're different on different days or that people, everybody is different and can still coach in that context. Like, is, is there a good number of coaches out there? Do you think there's room for improvement? What, what's your experience of it? Well, I think in, in every department of the game, there's room for improvement, whether that's players, coaches, administrators, like ev- everyone can be better. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that purely because over my career with Australia, I've had, uh, I think Tim Nielsen, well, he, might, he was definitely my academy coach, <laughs> but Greg Shippard, David Saker, Darren Lehman, Andrew McDonald, Justin Langer, um, I'm missing someone in there, Simon Helmet at the Renegades. And then you've got some batting coaches and stuff under there. And I've had, mm. I've had great relationships with all of them guys. And so it's hard to speak as a collective of, of coaching as a collective, but I think it's, it's, it's probably getting better because got coaches need or coaches are understanding more of the modern day player and, and everyone learns differently as well. I'm someone who, if I read something, I, I struggle to learn it, but if I watch someone do it and then do it myself, mm. I, I can, I can generally pick it up a lot quicker. So it's understanding all of that kind of stuff. And, and when, when people come in and want to make an impact on an environment, that's generally when you'll get the, the telling you, you, you have to do this differently. Whereas when, when guys have got more time to work with a group and, and they can probably map out a plan for each player a little bit longer, I think that that's when, that's when you get the, the bit more softer approach, which, which will sit back and, and wait for the right opportunity to intervene rather than, the first time that you that you see um yeah that's it, a really that's a tough question to answer but um and oh, well, then you've got coaches that, that are a little bit head coaches that, that put a lot of faith in the assistants and that and they sort mm-hmm. of oversee the whole the whole environment so uh, yeah it's a, it's a difficult one to answer I reckon your head's just falling across a bit, Finchie, when you're at the start of your innings. Um, I've done that. Up, I've yeah. done that since I was about eight years old, mate. And <laughs> I, I, the, the more I work on it, the worse it gets. I can tell you. It's, I just, at, at I just wanted to get you on at, here. At the moment, I'm, I'm just trying. I'm trying to open up my front foot slightly because in the in my first couple of well, ten balls, when you're obviously the most vulnerable, techniques at its worst because my front foot sort of plants across itself and. Your, your knee obviously bends that way. Your bat's trying to come this way. That, that's not a great combination. Some days you get away with it. Other times you get out first ball. And yeah, so that, that's, that's just one thing I'm trying to work out at the moment. Just like continually just drilling it. Uh, it's just nice. When you, when you, it's a, it's obviously a sea ball hit ball though. Just sea ball hit ball, yeah. mate. It's a simple game. <laughs> well, you know what, you know what's funny about that? The drill that I do most is standing there with my feet dead still. So your weight has oh, to get yeah. over. The, well, your, your weight has to get to the ball. You have to be in a good position. But when your feet don't get in your way, and your head doesn't get in the way because your head's falling over, so your feet have to go there. It's a much simpler game. Mm. But obviously, when the ball starts moving around, you, you're obviously more vulnerable if you if you're not moving your feet. But it's so easy when when nothing gets in the way of your bat. Yeah, <laughs> I noticed that's what third have grade. It for years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just sort of, you know, obviously you, you were sort of stepping across the stumps there. So try to correct that and just be careful if you open up your front, if you, if you open up the front dog, then you can't actually get the shoulder engaged as well. So correct. just something the grade cricketers are, yeah. it's just something you need to think about there. Yeah, I'm not going to help you do that. that. I'm just going to say that off my top of my head and just leave that with you. Hey, hey, hundred percent. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> hey, b- before you go uh, to Pakistan um, for some white ball stuff, which is, which is happening really soon. Um, there's there's concerning stuff in the press today. As we oh, we're recording on Wednesday, Finchie, about um, politics threatening the one day series by Peter Lawler. I mean, seriously, it, it, there's there's a possibility. It says there's a possibility games could be cancelled, but they probably won't because there's so much goodwill for the Australian side. Uh, because there's a mass protest that's set to take place close to the team hotel. Um, right. I haven't uh, seen it. Okay. Right. Well, I mean, you're probably going to get off this call and get a brief about that, but Lawler's um. Law, Pete Lawler's reported okay. that, um, but one of the uh, so you, I, I, I doubt you're going to comment on that. I, I guess the um, I guess the point golf. is that like, <laughs> um, 
I guess the point is like that, you know, a lot of guys were concerned about going over beforehand, but they've all gone. There's, um, but you know, things have changed. There's dynamic situation in Pakistan. You know, do you know how guys are feeling about heading over? Well, from, from all the guys I've spoken to, it's just a huge amount of excitement to get over there. I, I, I reckon there might be only one or two guys in the squad who have been there before and that they've been on underage tours. So um, mm. it'll be my first tour there. So I can't wait to, awesome. to get over there and, and, you just well, just seen the test matches. The, the first one was obviously a, a long old slog for both teams, and and this one's setting up beautifully for for an eventful finish on day five. So um, the cricket's been great. They're they're unbelievably passionate fans, and yeah, can't wait to get over there. It's awesome. Nice one. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Finchy. Wishing you all the best for Pakistan, KKR, um, and you know your strategies for with your dealing with your partner, forgiveness, permission, all that kind of stuff. I'm um, just she, she's can... just here. Do you want to ask her? Oh, not really. Uh, you know, I'm sort of... no, good call. Good call. <laughs> um, sort of recording this. Uh, people listening. But um, yeah, and just with the technique stuff, obviously falling. Uh, yeah. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. Just keep sorry that in mind. about all that. Yeah. Uh, mate, be- best of luck and thanks for being so generous on the show, mate. Pleasure, boys. Cheers. Thank you very much to Finchy. Um, Manscaped pairs before we get into hashtag I said you say it's a big show. It's a big show. And I just want to point out this at this juncture uh, that uh, we will be back on Monday. The next show will be out on Monday. Obviously, hashtag I said you say Friday is out tomorrow, uh, Friday, of course. Uh, but then we'll be back on Monday. We will obviously we're trying to follow the Pakistan Australia series, so they want to start a show midway through that game, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I know there's cricket happening all the time, but yeah. Next show is out on Monday, and then we'll get back onto the 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 third test, I think, starts next, end of next week. So, yeah, um, that's in Pakistan, obviously. The third test in Pakistan. Manscaped. Manscaped. All right, here goes. I've got something to talk about here with Manscaped. I'm not going to start with a round of applause and all that sort of shit. Uh, okay. they, they, we're, we're talking about the ultra premium collection. So this isn't the lawnmower. This isn't the actual fucking clipper that gets rid of the locks and all that sort of gear to sharpen you up and it's easy and you do it in the shower and all, all, that, all that kind of stuff. It's fine. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Uh, it's fine. The ultra premium collection... They sent they sent me a box, and I know they sent you a box. You opened this way earlier than I. I've been sort of moving and stuff. I got them to send it to Darwin. Takes a little while. Been some floods, and it arrived. I opened the box. Yeah. I opened the box, and it is a good collection of stuff, right? So I just want to read it out. This is not my point, but it's like uh, there's a there's body wash, there's moisturizer, there's yeah. uh, two lip in balm. one shampoo con- conditioner, there's lip balm, uh, maybe a couple other things. And the the thing that got me about reading this bit last week was Manscaped's signature scent. Yeah. And I gotta say, he goes, I have to say, yeah, I expected the signature scent to be fucking woeful. I really <laughs> did. <laughs> yeah. But guess what? It isn't. Surprise, surprise. Are you paid by these guys? And. Yeah. Not only that, I tested it. I tested it with my wife, who doesn't appreciate being incorporated into this show, and I'm hoping sure. she doesn't listen to it. And I'm hoping that others who work with her, who in the past have relayed to her things <laughs> that I've said on the show, um, I think unhelpfully, possibly trying yeah. to go behind my back with some shit. Yeah, oh, I'm fucking shit, subtweeting okay. that. Yeah, nah, yeah. not really. I don't give a fuck. Um, <laughs> you certainly sound like you don't give a fuck. Uh, <laughs> like she, she, I, I put it to her. Like what do you what do you think about this scent? And she said, "Yeah, that's good. I like it. She wants she wants more." And look, look, look I have lovely things to say about my wife. She's an accomplished doctor. She's mm. um she's she's well raised. She has higher brow tastes than me. Uh, mm. She would be she would love the opportunity to smash me when it comes to smells and just being a bit low brow. And she didn't. Okay. She said, "No, she likes it. The scent is good." Uh, the scent part it, it passes the smell test okay. so uh, and that's across that range and I can say that that's an actual story I've brought rather than just reading the copy ultra premium collection you can get that all the lawnmower all that sort of stuff to look good play good feel good manscaped.com use the code TJC for 20% off plus free shipping is it don't know you'll just see it at the checkout hashtag ask TJC we've made it to the end Harry Young wrote in Pez he said, hashtag RCDC, dear boys, recently me and my three other bloke housemates decided to purchase an inflatable spa tub for the backyard. 
Even though we live in Sydney, in the Sydney inner west, and the beach is only a 20 minute drive away, the opportunity of having a tub at home was too good to miss. <laughs> okay. <laughs> However, you cannot miss that opportunity. Yeah. However, as I never scaled the lofty heights of grey cricket, played any park stuff with close mates after high school, I'm not sure if we are correctly reflecting the grey tub culture you seem to talk so eloquently about. My question, therefore, is this. How can I best replicate the tubbing experience you so often discuss via your information exchange on hashtag AskTGC Fridays? On Patreon, obviously. Should I learn some cock tricks to entertain the other housemates with? Should I should I start only speaking from the side of my mouth? Or would this be pointless as none of my housemates are cricket friends and as such, they don't really care about who is uh, the alpha in any given situation? Should I become mates with the budgie smuggler CEO so I can hear more SCG tubbing stories to enhance my own tubbing experience? Given my lack of professional tubbing, is it even possible to truly tub in the safety of my own home? Any possible guidance with the above would be helpful. Yours in tubs, Harry. P.S. Enjoy Darwin, Pez. No message, no message for me, so. All right, fuck you, Harry. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, that is a brilliant question. Mm. Like, I guess my, my first thought is if, if he's looking to replicate grade cricket tubbing, mm-hmm. firstly, that's very funny. Um, very funny. That he, he, like, he wants, like, presumably influenced by the podcast, he wants to cosplay what is usually, truthfully, yeah. a rather traumatic experience for most <laughs> young men who are yeah. um, just going through a forced rite of passage uh, that that it probably in 20, 30 years will be the subject of lawsuits. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, he wouldn't be surprised at some level. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah. If he wants to and do it tastefully, it makes me think about pop groups. You know, like in pop groups, like confected pop groups where you have like you have the whether it's, you know, Spice Girls or One Direction or whatever or like Backstreet mm-hmm. Boys, show them age. Like, you know, you've got the good looking one. You've got the young, vulnerable one. You've got like yeah. the harder edged, brooding one. Yeah, the edgy one. Like, yeah, there's, yeah. there's something there's a trapping for everyone or you've got the nerd one or something, you know, like mm. you're trying to capture as much of the child demographic to market to them and sell product as possible. Uh, right. And I'd say the same is for t- if you're trying to cosplay tubbing, everyone needs a role, you know, yep. like you, you need that it's wrong, it's wrong, but someone needs to be scared to do it. Someone needs to be afraid to do it so you can bully them uh, yep. and insist that they do it for uh, various social rewards or punishments. Uh, so that person has to be nominated. There has mm. to be somebody with a big penis. So the biggest penis person has to, and that has to be what they live through. They live through the penis. Yeah, that's their identity. Uh, there has they, to be, live, they live through the penis, mate. They live through the penis. There has to be somebody that, like, if you're going to have a tub, like, what what happens before the tub is as important as what happens in the tub. Do you know what I mean? Like, so there has to be some conversation between everyone. You've finished something, uh, and the captain um, should be like. Because I was suspected our captain, he didn't really like tubbing, but he wanted to preemptively strike it. He he sort of he doff protest too much, so he'd get he'd get into his underwear and then deliver the team talk, and he'd rub his penis through his underwear while he was doing it while he was talking, and and that's what we call chubbing up. <laughs> uh, and so you've got to have the person that chubs up before the tub. It leaves you wondering, is that the natural size of his penis or, uh, uh, um, I did this happen at your club or is this not just my club? (laughs) There's got to be someone whose penis. (laughs) There's got to be someone who leaves because they got to go to a 21st. But you know it's because they don't want to get naked with other blokes. And then I suppose if you're in a tub, an actual tub, it's it's hard because you can't have one person who pisses on somebody else because obviously the stream just gets just dilutes into the water. But I suppose you could try. Um, <laughs> I suppose you could try. But when you have the chats, you've got to talk normally, laugh, pretend everyone's comfortable while side-eyeing to see the length of someone else's penis. It's very exhausting. It's very exhausting. It's very uncomfortable. You hope that when you get naked that your penis is in a good condition to present. And if someone has a big penis, yeah, like the cock tricks are helpful, I guess. Uh, What do you think? 
I mean, fuck, is there, is there anything wrong? I mean, inaccurate. I know there's a lot wrong with it. Fucking hell. <laughs> it leaves you wondering if that's the natural size of his penis. <laughs> It's like a fucking Carrie Bradshaw bit. And I couldn't help but wonder. <laughs> Tubs in the city. <laughs> this is sex in the city, but for great cricket. <laughs> that's good. That's, a, that's an idea. Does anyone know how to write TV? That's good. Fuck me! Fucking four four characters, four oh. characters with like a uh, uh, oh. overlay narration, but it's grade cricket. And I wondered, was my penis big enough for this club? <laughs> <laughs> was was I chubby up? Or was was? <laughs> That's cricket, man. That's not fucking Baba Azam's wonderful oh. knock. That's not real cricket. That, this is cricket. This is real. Maybe fifteen years ago. Ah, oh, fuck me. Well, <laughs> I don't know where to go from that. That might be a way to finish the show. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much to Beth Mooney. Thank you very much to Aaron Finch. Thanks to Tom Deason over there in Pakistan. Thanks for you guys for watching, for listening, uh, and all that kind of gear. You know, shoot us a like. Shoot us a subscribe if you're new here. Uh, we'll be back on Monday. See you guys then. Have a good weekend. These are doing well. <laughs>